where the soul will never see what it sees here anymore when it comes to life in the flesh and the devil being the prince of this world and the battles that we all face to keep our mind and lives in harmony with the teachings of Christ in the New Testament. This will be the third installment of our studies concerning identifying the church of Christ. For those who are in the denominational world with the denominational concept of the church, they have no idea about the church of Christ as that term is defined and used by the inspired writers in the New Testament, Romans 16, 16. Again, I remind you that that's not the only descriptive term for the body of the saved. As you go through the New Testament, you'll find the church has no proper name. You'll find it does have descriptive terms, such as Romans 16, 16, the church is of Christ, salute you. Later, we'll talk about the organization of the church, but suffice it now to say that it's organized on a local level. Thus, churches of Christ salute you. One worldwide church of Christ. Yet it's made up and organized into congregations or churches in geographic locations. But the concept of denominationalism simply says there is one great invisible church and all the different denominations make it up. There's one thing drastically wrong with that concept of the church. It is nowhere found in anybody's New Testament. Thus, we seek to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is set out in the words of Christ, thus the New Testament of Christ. I don't know why it is so strange to talk about the church as the church of Christ. It certainly describes the saved and the relationship of the saved to the Savior and vice versa. It's also called the church of God. Of course, Christ is God. He came to do the Father's will. It's talked about as the body of Christ. It's talked about as the family of Christ and several other terms of designation. We settle on church of Christ simply because it is plain and bold in declaring the saved's relationship to the Savior. And he who is head of the body, which Colossians 1.18 says, is the church. Now, we must be able to give an answer to those who ask us as members of that church anything about the church. And our answer must be from the Word of God. Now, if you're a member of a church that's not the Church of Christ, you're obligated, too, to show me why you are a member of that church. You're obligated to have the attitude toward the church that's taught in the New Testament. A member of a church then should be able to give the reason or reasons that he or she is a member of the church that they are a part of. I want to say again, and I can't emphasize it too much to everybody, what Peter, inspired of the Holy Spirit, wrote to Christians almost 2,000 years ago when he said, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer. That word answer comes from apologia, which means make a defense as to why you believe what you believe and prove it. To every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15 To add to that, in defense of his apostleship, Paul wrote, Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Thus, when his apostleship was challenged by false teachers, he was able to prove by adequate evidence and credible witnesses that he was an apostle of Christ. Paul told the young preacher, Timothy, that he is to be prepared for every good work, 2 Timothy 2.21. Well, a part of that work is defending the truth and knowing the Bible well enough to know why you are what you are and where you are, and to tell other people the same. You can see again that he repeated to the young evangelist Titus, be ready to every good work, Titus 3.1. A good work is defined by the New Testament. The church here is to do the will of Christ. 
it will do then, as it does the will of Christ, a good work. And part of that is teaching the truth. And part of that is teaching about the church. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We must not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul said that to the Romans in Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He gives us the reason. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. I think it's interesting to emphasize also here that the gospel is the power to save the believer. But if the believer, the moment he or she believes, is saved, then why is the gospel said to be the savior of the believer? Thus teaching that while belief is essential to salvation, Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, as well as Hebrews 11 and 6. We must understand that it's only one necessary and important step in God's plan of salvation revealed in the last will and testament of Christ. There's also the command to the believer to repent of one's sins, Acts 17.30, to confess that faith that Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10.10, 10, and then to be buried with his Lord in baptism for the remission of sins, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Acts 2 and verse 38. Also concerning being ashamed of the reason that the Bible teaches we are members of the church, Jesus taught, Luke 9, 26, For whosoever, and that's as broad as the human race, whosoever, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Then Paul wrote to Timothy again saying, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, 2 Timothy 1.8. So I simply use all of that to tie in with what we've already said in this series of studies on identifying the church of Christ. And again, I hasten to say, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament. Now in previous lessons, we've studied about the church. Again, I say that's revealed on the pages of the New Testament. And in those studies, we learned that the church was founded by the scriptural builder, who is Jesus Christ. That it has the scriptural foundation, who is Christ. And that it started in a certain place. The church that Jesus built started in the city of Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. And that's recorded in your own Bible in Acts chapter 2. Thus, we have emphasized that any church with a different builder and with a different foundation or place of beginning cannot be the church that Jesus promised to build in Matthew 16, 18. So now in this sermon, we will study how that Jesus Christ is the founder of only one church. I simply say, again, His church. He built it. He owns it. He purchased it with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. Surely we will not take the position that his blood or the institution was not worth the purchase price, his blood. Now he who has all, not some or most, but all authority in heaven and earth said, Upon this rock, the confession of truth that Peter made, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus did not say that he would build a church. He did not say there would be one church that's invisible to the human eye and all these different denominations with different names and creeds and organizations and ways of being saved would make it up. That's denominationalism. It's not taught in the Bible, it's condemned, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. So how simply, plainly, and forthrightly did our Lord state, I will build my church. Question, how many churches did Jesus promise to build? 
Well, here the denominational mind that is permeating, dominated believers in Christ for almost 500 years takes over in most people's minds. They simply are so caught up in that definition of Christianity, they cannot think simply and only as the New Testament teaches. But you must learn to do that. Your faith should rest in what the Bible teaches. If it rests in the commandments and doctrines of men, then it's false. For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. The word church is a noun. And it's singular in number. The widespread and long time false denominational view of the church, I say again, and you must keep saying it because people just can't conceive of the church, say, beyond sectarian denominational Christianity. They've been blinded by that, and people can't see the New Testament teaching about Jesus' one single solitary church. However, such a false view, and false it is, no matter how long and how many believe it, does not change the New Testament truth that Jesus built only one church. Remember, Jesus declared, My words shall not pass away, Matthew 24, 35. All human religions will pass away. Some of them have come and gone already. All of them will not stand the test of standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and giving account in the light of his New Testament of what they believed and practiced. Jesus said that his word would judge everybody in the last day. And it doesn't change, John 12, 48. Now, when you look into your New Testament, and therein is a problem, people don't look into it. They don't study it. They don't read it. They're not familiar with it. They don't know how to study it. Yet they want to be acceptable to God. The apostle teaches that there is only one body. Ephesians 4, verse 4. John referred to that this past Wednesday night in the devotional talk and talking about the unity of believers. Now, think about this. When Paul wrote that to the church in Ephesus, as an inspired apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to that congregation, knowing this letter would be circulated around through the churches, he said there's one body. They knew what one was. There's one body, a spiritual body. Then in Romans 12, 4 through 5, the same principle is stated. Why can't we throw off the yoke that's on our necks of human concepts of the church and let Christ have his way with us. Most of those who believe in Christ have sung that song, that we ought to let Christ have his way with us. I do not know how you do that if you do not follow his last will and testament, the words of the Bible. Then in 1 Corinthians 12, 20, concerning the matter of one body, he says to the church there, but now there they are many members, but one body. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 20. There's no place in the New Testament that Paul or any other inspired writer taught the denominational concept of the church. But you may be asking, does the body mean the church? Well, I've already pointed that out, but we'll give emphasis to it because of the false concepts that prevail among those who believe in Christ as Savior. Paul said to again to the Ephesian church in Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. Of Christ, he says, and put all things under his feet. That's Christ's feet. This echoes back to Matthew 28, 18, where Christ said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and earth, and gave him to be head, that's the Father, over all things to the church. Now watch the next verse. Which is his body. How important is that church? He then says, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, my brethren need to realize if you're a Christian, then you are a member of that church. You say, well, I know that. But do you realize then you're a part of that institution built by Christ and purchased by his blood that fills all in all? That what we do as individual Christians have to do with the church filling all in all sounds rather important to me and it also indicates how important it is that as individual members, 
we live like the New Testament teaches. Again, regarding Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. No one in heaven or on earth is to have the preeminence or the position that Christ had, has above all things that exist. Christ has the preeminence. That's why he has all authority. Each goes together. The scriptures are clear in teaching that the church then is the body and that the body is the church. Using the rational powers God gave us in the light of the revelation of his word that's in all our Bibles, we must logically conclude that there is one church that Jesus built and I'm interested in that church that Jesus built. It is in complete harmony with what we've quoted several times in these lessons, that Christ would build my church, he says. I will build my church. C-H-U-R-C-H, singular, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus taught the oneness of the church by using a vineyard with God as a husbandman. In John chapter 15, we want to read for a while, I am the true vine, verse 1, and my father is the husbandman. Notice there are not a multiplicity of vineyards, a denomination as denominations teach, but there's only one vineyard. Let me emphasize again, because it's just accepted and never questioned as to whether it's right or wrong. Today, there are thousands of religious vineyards claiming, I say claiming, God as their vine dresser. This is what one sees in denominationalism and other religions founded on the commandments and doctrines of men. But listen. This is not what you see when you study the Bible and especially the New Testament concerning the Lord's church. Let me begin reading and go down through verse 8 of John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the words which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, let me emphasize that right now. If a man abideth not in me, he is cast forth as the branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, speaking to the apostles here, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now watch. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Consider what we learn from this. Christ is pictured as the true vine in each redeemed person, each Christian, as a branch in the vine. The scriptures never present Christ as a plurality of vines with many branches in each vine, and each vine and its branches growing in such a way as to conflict with the growth of the others while all claiming the same God and the same Savior. The scriptures present one great and beautiful vine, Jesus Christ, with every saved person as a branch in him and bearing fruit to his glory. And how do they do that? By adhering to his word, by following his teaching, by submitting to his will. Remember, Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
Now, denominationalism has attempted on countless occasions, in print and orally, to tell us that the vine is the original and true church, and all the branches are the different denominations of the world. This is their, I'm pretty sure, number one argument to defend the denominational concept of the church. But I simply ask anyone anywhere, please honestly and rationally consider what the scriptures teach on this matter and build your faith out of what the scriptures teach, Romans 10, 17. Christ was speaking to his disciples. He was not speaking to denominations. I've emphasized that in reading the passage, John 15, 5. Christ said his disciples abide, were to abide in Christ, me, in the vine. Therefore, if you're abiding in a branch from the denomination standpoint and concept, erroneous though it is, then you're in error. Again, we emphasize that Jesus plainly taught that a branch is a person, John 15, 6. The American Standard says a man, 1901 American Standard, not a denomination, not a church. I had a fellow walk up to me and I was doing work in my college years at the paper mill and my father worked there for years and they knew who I was through him daddy had already engaged numerous times as opportunity availed itself with discussions of the bible with denominational people so when I came to work there they knew something about me and that the word was out I was a preacher and I never forget this one person entrenched in denominational concept of the church came up to me and said, oh, so you're a church of Christ. I looked at him for a split second as a very young person. Nearly everybody else out there was older. With respect, I said, it should be obvious that I'm not a whole church. But he didn't know better. He didn't even get the point. Because he had no concept of the New Testament definition and use of the term church of Christ. I did respond to say, no, I'm just a Christian. And then I added, Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And he simply did not know what to say. It's foreign to any denominational person. To teach otherwise then is to pervert this particular pa parable of Christ being the vine and individuals being the branches. It's absurd to think that on the true vine can grow a grape, a pear, an orange, and so on. Why the seed principle was established back over in the book of Genesis. The seed principle of each producing after its own kind forbids such thinking. For the word is the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. And wherever that word is sown in honest and good hearts, it cannot produce anything but the kingdom church. And remember, Jesus used those terms as we've studied already interchangeably in Matthew 16 when he said, I will build my church. And he told Peter, I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom in the same context. So that's another way that the saved are referred to. They're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. The oneness of the church is also presented in the figure of a house or a family. Paul informed the young preacher Timothy that the church is the house of God or the family of God, 1 Timothy 3.15. He even taught how he should, or mentioned to him, instructed him how he ought to behave himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Thus, when he wrote that, then the church was there. The Holy Spirit called it God's family. He taught the church in Rome that we're God's family in Romans 8, 16 through 17. He said to them, the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Now, this seems rather simple, but yet it's overlooked, ignored. The Bible doesn't present millions of different families. 
each one to one extent or another conflicting with all other families, each with a different and conflicting government of its own, each wearing its own name, claiming all the time to have the same head, Jesus Christ, and to have the same Father. But denominationalism presents the family of God in a blasphemous manner because one father with children in more families than one can count attributes to God a terrible thing. And they don't even realize that's what it implies. Christ ha God has his children in his family. And that's the only place you're going to find them. And that's the reason you must study the New Testament of Christ to learn of the church of Christ. You know, no one has a problem with talking about the New Testament of Christ. They have no problem talking about the blood of Christ. But they don't like to talk about the church of Christ. Well, I suggest all of them are found in the same book. All of them are descriptive terms showing a relationship. Men ought not by word or deed to cast such a poor reflection on God as to say that he, his father, has children and thousands of families. The divine picture is one great united family with God as the father, Jesus as the elder brother, and all members working together for the good of this family to the glory of God Almighty. Now, that's the best I can do economically stating exactly what the church is that you read about in your own New Testament. I say again, one reason people don't know a thing about it, they don't read the Bibles, and specifically the New Testament. The oneness of the church is also portrayed in the figure of the one fold and one shepherd. Yet Jesus taught how simple, much more simple could it be. There will be one fold and one shepherd. John 10, 16. If I can understand one and I can understand fold and I can understand shepherd and I can understand one, this should not be difficult to understand. We must leave what our Lord, we must believe what our Lord said concerning his flock. And we must leave men who teach contrary to that, that God is pleased with many flocks each claiming to have the same shepherd. Simply put, the New Testament of Christ does not teach there are thousands of flocks, each with its peculiar kind of sheep and more or less at variance with one another. Jesus said, one flock, one shepherd. And it's like a fellow said one time, said, what is it that we don't understand about the number one. There are no more true flocks than there are shepherds. Yet among those who are denominational in their concept of the church will declare there's one God. They will declare there is one Savior, Jesus Christ. But the same book that teaches that says there's one church that Christ built. And it's described on the pages of the one New Testament that Christ had. The oneness of the church is further taught in our Lord's prayer to the Father. In John 17, 20 and 21, he said, Neither pray I for these alone, meaning the apostles of Christ. If you read the verses preceding, you'll see that. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's me and that's you. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou sent me. John made reference to this on Wednesday night. Let me pause and say that while we are addressing this to human churches who have the denominational concept of the church, one invisible church made up of all the different denominations, we in the church to remain the church that is of by and for Jesus Christ for the salvation of men and the glory of God must labor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that means we all must determine to submit to the objective truth of God's Word that teaches how one becomes a Christian, when one becomes a Christian, and how one functions as a Christian. If we're all going to start doing on, operating on the way we feel, there's no telling what all will happen. Well, I know we'll become another denomination. It's just that simple. Where we're governed by our own thinks, those and opinions and likes and dislikes, rejecting the authority of Christ and the words of Christ. 
Jesus plainly in John 17, 20 and 21 prayed that all who believe on him would be one. This prayer is, how shall I say it? It's a cutting rebuke to the plurality of churches in our day and to division within the body of Christ. But, as some do in the church, the denominations ignore it in their efforts to justify a system wholly unknown to the New Testament teaching. A system that arose 1,500 years after the Lord established His one single solitary church, of which you can read in the New Testament, even its beginning, as we've studied in Acts 2. Jesus did not pray for oneness and turning right around, establish many churches conflicting in doctrine and with one another. Anytime a person says that Jesus found in many churches and doctrines to fit each one, he is accusing the Lord of hypocrisy. For my Lord said, as it reads in your own Bible, I will build my church. And he did. As we sing in the song in Acts chapter 2 on that first Pentecost in Jerusalem following the resurrection of Christ. Denominational preachers and their members rejoice and have even been known publicly to thank God in prayer for the many different denominations of the world today so each could find the church of his choice and be happy in it. Well, let's just say that's all well and good. Now pick your Bible up, study it, and come and show whether the Bible ever taught any such thing. And I'll tell you before you start, but I urge you to do it personally, you won't find it because it's not there. Denominations cannot exist without ignoring the prayer of Christ for unity. They cannot exist without rejecting Paul's statement to the church at Corinth that we're to be of the same mind in the same judgment, saying that there be no divisions among you, but be of the same mind in the same judgment. That means that we operate with the determination to abide by the authority of Christ regardless of what members do or don't do or what religious people all about us believing in Christ do or don't do. We abide in the doctrine of Christ. That's what John said in 2 John beginning verse 8 reading through verse 10. To abide in the doctrine of Christ. The teaching of Christ. The truth that governs us. That makes us Christians. Jesus did not pray for such a monstrosity as denominationalism. And the New Testament nowhere teaches it. Denominations, again I say, cannot exist without ignoring that basic fact. So as we conclude this lesson today and noting the identifying marks in the New Testament of the one church that Jesus built, one not only should be, but must be, a member of that church that Jesus built. Those people on the day of Pentecost when the church began were pricked in their heart by the preaching of the gospel. They cried out unto Peter, Acts 2.37, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were believers. Denominationalism said, you're all right where you are. Nothing else you can do to be saved or you'll be trying to merit your salvation and work your way to heaven. He took them as believers, which belief was formed on the basis of the truth. And it was the truth from heaven because they saw the miracles that no man could do in the apostles and happening to the apostles that caused them to say, God's in this. And he told them as believers, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 41, Then they that glad, gladly received his word were baptized and were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, the church being a family, no baby can join a family. But one can be born anew, John 3, 3 and 5, by water and the Spirit. And when the Spirit taught us a plan of salvation, of believing in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Christ, and being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, then we're added to the spiritual body of Christ, the family of God. We're born of water and the Spirit, and the Lord adds us to the church, Acts 2, 42 and 47. We have thus far, as we close the lesson, studied from the Bible that the New Testament of Christ teaches that the church, number one, was founded by the scriptural builder, Christ. Number two, was founded on the scriptural foundation, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
that it was founded at the scriptural place, Jerusalem, and that Christ is the founder of only one church, his church, the identifying marks of which are in the seat of the kingdom, the word of God, the New Testament specifically. Now, I know there's repetitiveness as we move between these various topics. That's only natural because they're all dealing with the same subject, the church that Jesus built, the church of which you read, the New Testament church, read of in your New Testament. So I hope these will serve to help us link together a good defense for ourselves as members of it, of those who uphold a system foreign to the New Testament and contrary to the Word of God. But it will cause, as people listen to it, who are in these churches, sincerely in them, but they don't know what the New Testament teaches, to realize that the whole denominational system is contrary to the will of heaven. That it is not Christianity. That is the devil's brew, and that we ought to return to plain, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. Now you can take that to the judgment give account to God in the light of it, along with other things pertaining to being faithful in the church. And you're assured of hearing well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in the joys of thy Lord. If as a child of God you've wandered, you haven't prepared yourself as you ought, or you've transgressed in some way the teachings of Christ concerning living faithful to the Lord, then we urge you in the second law of pardon to repent of your sins, confess them, and we'll pray with you and for you. God's promise to hear and forgive. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. And you who must give an answer for something you must do. What shall it be? What shall it be? What shall your answer be? <clears throat> what will you do with Jesus? Oh, what shall your Bye.